Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Pamela Scott. I'm the head of programs for the Westerly Historical Society, and I'm so glad you're here today. Our program is about our favorite Watch Hill Lighthouse. What a wonderful spot. I, I have to tell you, I was there recently and just almost had this program there. We w but the day after a nor'easter would have <laughs> panicked me. I, I'm sure I couldn't have done it. So I'm glad we're here today and we can welcome Anne Snowden, our speaker, and she will introduce herself. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs> thank you, Pamela, and thank you for having me back. I think it's been uh, about three years since I last spoke on the history of the lighthouse. And uh, I see several people in here who have either lived in the lighthouse or still live in the lighthouse or wish they live in the lighthouse. <laughs> um, so thank you so very much. Um, I became president of uh, the board that runs the lighthouse. It's known as the Watch Hill Lighthouse Keepers Association. And I became president of the board in 2012. Uh, we have a wonderful board of about, I guess we're up to 19 people at the moment. And it's a diverse uh, board, uh, wonderful local people, all of whom have some sort of a, a talent to bring to the association. So we've got film producers, uh, we've got people who are um, absolutely outstanding at raising money. Uh, we have people who uh, know the fish and the fishermen beautifully. Uh, we have people like me, I am a historian. I teach 7th uh, and 8th grade, I've been doing that for 31 years down in New York during the week, and I'm here every weekend. Uh, so we all bring something to the association. The association was formed in 1986. In 1985, the uh, tenants who were still living in the lighthouse at that time, there, there were um, two people living in there that were Coast Guard representatives, um, and they, they shared that um, the lighthouse was going to be automated, and that was the process that was ongoing with the U.S. Coast Guard uh, in the uh, 1980s. And they approached the local Watch Hill Memorial and Improvement Society and said, would you all be interested in taking over the maintenance of the lighthouse? Over a period of time, um, a wonderful woman, uh, Liz Crawford Driscoll, uh, spearheaded efforts to raise funds and to investigate the sorts of steps necessary to turn the lighthouse, an act of aid to navigation, to turn that lighthouse and its property into something that would be open to the public and maintained for everybody to enjoy. Uh, to her delight, um, her initial expectations of roughly needing about $25,000 to run the lighthouse each year. Uh, to her delight, that number was quickly exceeded and multiplied by 10 and then even more so uh, by local members, mostly of Watch Hill, but a lot of people in Westerly too. And the association was born on August 31st, 1986. Uh, the Watch Hill Lighthouse Keepers officially took over the running of the lighthouse and we are now a nonprofit group that has been functioning since 86 to maintain this property uh, for everybody to come down and use, for people to still fish down there. There was a lot of concern. Um, the Rhode Island Mobile Fishermen's Organization was concerned that the lighthouse would, in fact, close off access to their ability to fish. And when the blues are running, it's, it's really crowded down there. Uh, we still have them down there. They uh, contribute uh, efforts in terms of emptying a dumpster, which is necessary at times, and they help to keep their eyes and ears on what's happening down at the rocks. So their presence down there um, has meant a great deal to us as well. So when Pamela called me um, and asked if I'd be willing to speak again, um, I said, sure, and I'm going to speak mainly today uh, about some of the efforts that uh, we are undertaking to expand the reach of the museum and to expand the reach of the lighthouse in general. So, the museum building uh, was originally this over here, which is our uh, oil building originally. 
And after the association took over the lighthouse, the plan was to open a small museum here, which we did. Uh, we took the wonderful Fresnel lens uh, out of the lighthouse. The Coast Guard gave us the uh, uh, ability to hold on to that lens in perpetuity for a great amount of liability insurance, let me insure you. Uh, but uh, we had that lens actually sitting out in the open of that building for many years, just sitting right in the middle of the building. Uh, gradually, however, the collection began to grow. And so in about, uh, it was about 10 years ago, 2009, we began discussing plans to renovate the fog signal building and the collection moved over there. So it, it doubled in size. And this is our Fresnel lens right here, which is one of our greatest attractions. Now in 2011, uh, the Coast Guard said to us, yes, go on and hold on to the lens, uh, but you're going to need to build a case around it. Uh, so we worked with Brian Cooper, who is based over in Pawkatuck, to build us uh, this incredible case which completely encloses the lens. One of the issues that we face with the lens, of course, is it, you know, like any other glass, it attracts dust. And for years we were a little bit oblivious um, and sort of cleaned it with, well, Windex and other sort of things which are not good for Fresnel lenses. Uh, our lens is a fourth order lens, and this is the lens, if I'm correct, and Bob, correct me if I say anything wrong because I see you back there. Uh, this lens uh, is the second one that the lighthouse actually had. The first one was placed in the lighthouse tower about uh, 1856 or 7, and this one is roughly from about 1898. So this is the lens that came out of the tower in 86 when uh, the lighthouse was automated. So now uh, enclosed within this case, uh, the amount of dust is limited. Uh, it does create an interesting issue for us um, in that this case is you know, wonderful, but it's very large. Uh, so that one of the um, things that we've been discussing is, is how best to hang the collection uh, so that individuals who come to the museum will be encouraged to walk around the case because it kind of takes up the entire space, uh, but to walk around the case and to see other objects that might be behind the case. And then, of course, you come up with the other question, do you really want to hang anything behind this anyway? Will people actually walk around it? So this is one of our ongoing issues. Uh, let me show you. This is a different view over here on the left-hand image. This shows you the interior. Uh, the building the museum is in today, it's the 1909 Fog Signal Building. Now, originally, the Fog Signal equipment pretty much occupied this entire room. And when the uh, Lighthouse Keepers Association renovated this building, uh, we had to um, install this concrete flooring. And then we had to begin to ask ourselves, how are we going to hang what we have? Uh, and at the moment, we have kind of a haphazard uh, collection. Uh, some wonderful photographs, some of them donated by people right in this room, so I thank you. Uh, we have paintings that local artists uh, will do on the spur of the moment and then give to us, but they really have no historic value. Uh, we have fun little objects, um, such as this telegraph here. Uh, this telegraph actually um, is a favorite of all children uh, who visit uh, the museum. Uh, the telegraph was uh, the main way for someone on a ship, for the, the pilot's house, really, to communicate with the engine room. And there's a wonderful bell, so if you uh, pull this handle here, it makes a wonderful, you know, clanging sound. And when we have Westerly Middle School come through, which they do now every June, uh, one of their favorite things is to come in and make sure that they, too, can ring the bell. So if you can imagine 90 children ringing that bell for the space of two hours, um, you know some of the joys that I experienced down at the museum. Uh, but we want to keep these things out here. That's one of the questions that we have. How do you make a collection like this not only accessible to everyone, but also of interest to everyone? Because part of our goal in running uh, the Lighthouse Keepers Association is to ensure that 
interest in the lighthouse remains vital and active and reachable. So you want to keep the telegraph there and you also want to make sure that local artists feel inspired to do their work. Uh, but then you have to ask yourself, how much do you want to hang on the wall and how do you want to hang it? So at the moment, as I said, things are a little bit um, haphazard. On this slide over here on the left, we have a number of donations, which are wonderful. And if you look carefully, you can see that there's some similarity in these paintings. And that's because we believe that there was a local um, artist back in the late 1800s who had sort of a school or encouraged people to come down and create and paint almost identical scenes, which show the lighthouse and then the original life-saving station from 1879. I have two etchings, beautiful etchings, of this very same scene currently in my house, uh, waiting for restoration because the paper upon which they were done uh, really needs some attention. But it's, it's the identical scene to these paintings. Back in September, I received a wonderful email, um, and I receive a lot of them, uh, from somebody who has an oil painting of that very same scene, which he would like to donate. We would like to have it. Uh, but again, we run into this question of how many of these images should we have? How do we assess the historic value? And what can we use to inform visitors to the museum? Which ones really inform people of, of the history of the lighthouse. On the right hand screen we have a series of photographs and again this will be one of our tasks, it's one of the things that we're working on now. We have kind of a bit of an arrangement here that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, this is the fog signal here and then in some of these other images we see uh, photographic evidence of the destruction from Hurricane 38 and then if you drop down here, we've got the right here where the little dot is, the 1879 Life Saving Station, which was the first station built out at Lighthouse Point. Uh, we have images of ships going by. Uh, we have a little view here of East Beach with Watch Hill um, and what will be Holiday House up on the hill. So these are all arranged in a very thoughtful manner at one point, but do they tell the story, do they tell the history of the museum in the way uh, that it should be told? And the answer really is no. Um, they're fascinating. But one of our jobs going forward is really to dismantle some of these images, being careful, of course, to respect the donors, and then to rearrange them in such a way that we actually have a chronological presentation of the history of the lighthouse. Now many of us um, have heard, probably, of the wreck of the steamer, the Larchmont. Uh, this is a very famous wreck off of our shores. Um, it collided uh, with a coal-bearing schooner, the Harry Knowlton, in February of 1907. And the collision occurred somewhere uh, between Noise Neck and Quantikatog. Unfortunately, uh, there weren't a whole lot of survivors. Um, and uh, Margaret um, Carter's little book here on shipwrecks on the shores of Westerly, which I refer to quite a bit, actually has you know, wonderful descriptions of it, saying in particular that the impact was so ter terrific that the bow of the sailing craft plowed its way into more than half the breadth of the Larchmont. Uh, the Larchmont sank uh, relatively quickly. Uh, despite the efforts by various uh, life-saving individuals, and there was a significant loss of life. Well, one of the things um, that happened as a result of um, the Larchmont is that people got very interested in the memorabilia, and we have reports of um, a gentleman named Arthur Nash, more than likely a member of the Nash family, um, and Jonathan Nash was the first lighthouse keeper uh, back when the lighthouse was built in 1807. Uh, Arthur Nash um, seized upon the sails uh, from, the, uh, from the Larchmont and then 
cut various squares into postcards, and these became quite the collector's item. Of course, the interesting thing is when you look at these uh, postcards, some of them, as this one does, mentions Quantica Togs. Others, um, such as in um, this book, uh, show that it says noise neck. So depending on which sample you buy, uh, you get a different sort of taste of what exactly happened with this collision. So why do I mention and show these two images? Because one of the wonderful things that happens when you get to run a lighthouse, uh, as I said earlier, is you get all sorts of emails and phone calls uh, from people with a connection. Uh, these two items were uh, donated to us in August uh, by a gentleman named Bill Brown. And Bill lives over in Stonington, and his grandfather, Walter Davis, uh, was the first keeper of the life-saving station when it flipped over to become part of the U.S. Coast Guard. So he brought a whole lot of items um, to us at that time, including um, these two uh, really sort of interesting uh, postcards, which at some point in the near future um, I'm hoping to get framed. It's helpful. My husband actually is a, an artist and uh, artistic framer, so it's good to have him in the family. He's actually done quite a bit of work for the Lighthouse, um, for which I thank him in abstention. Uh, but these are the sorts of things that we get uh, that are regularly donated to us. And the question is, how do these bits and pieces, how do these artifacts inform us about the role of the lighthouse, the role of the life-saving station, and the role of the keepers uh, who lived on Lighthouse Point? Um, so I have another, just a close-up of that. And you can see here that Kwani is mentioned, and the wreck here. And it is, in fact, postcard size. So this is a wonderful piece of history. Uh, it doesn't directly link to the Watch Hill Lighthouse, but it does in fact link to the area. Uh, so this is one of the things that we will find a place uh, for in the narrative and history of uh, the Lighthouse. And a few years ago, um, we received sort of some questions about when are you going to start selling things? Why don't you sell t-shirts? Why don't you sell hats? Um, many of you may have visited Beavertail, and Beavertail has a thriving gift shop. We do not. One of the things that you run into when you're a non-for-profit organization is exactly how much profit you can actually make before you lose your status. And so we have always taken a sort of cautionary uh, approach uh, to the sale of merchandise. Uh, nonetheless, um, we got really interested in maybe experimenting. Um, so we ordered a couple of years ago um, these hats and these keychains, which we now sell down at the lighthouse, and they've uh, done enormously well. So we have them on display, um, again, asking ourselves, you know, how much interference uh, with the actual exhibit do we want the merchandise to have? Uh, so we've displayed it rather discreetly here, uh, which is in the little entryway when you walk into the museum. Down below, we have two shelves of local shells, approach, uh, you know, uh, sort of laid out appropriately for the height of children. When children come to the lighthouse, their traffic through the lighthouse museum uh, lasts about 30 seconds, if that. Uh, but their parents are generally a lot more interested in what's going on. So the shells are part of our ongoing efforts to provide something of interest to um, the little ones when they come in. And up above, we have Reginald Peck's uh, book, a copy of his book that he um, published on um, owners of Watch Hill properties and the history of Watch Hill. This is our little book that was published, uh, self-published back in 1986 uh, to um, tell the history of the Watch Hill Lighthouse Keepers and the history of the lighthouse in general. So we have just this little display here which helps to center the entry uh, into the Lighthouse Museum. So where are we today? Um, one of our biggest challenges that we are facing, even as I speak to you, is how do we restore and maintain this property? In uh, 2012, 
uh, right after I became president, I received a beautiful gift in the form of Hurricane Sandy, which destroyed the seawall, 220 feet of seawall, uh, which we had just rebuilt the year before. So in the process of investigating what in the world am I going to do with this, um, and essentially uh, sobbing over the phone multiple times to Bob Peacock, which I'm sure he remembers well, uh, we finally um, embarked upon a process of restoration uh, that came through the guidance of the Rhode Island Historic Preservation and Heritage Commission. We received the second largest of the Sandy grants given out in Rhode Island, uh, $447,500 to be precise. And part of the terms of that grant are that um, Rhode Island Historic Press has a 20-year easement over anything that we do, which means that any time we want to restore, repair, renovate, we need to have representatives not only from the Coast Guard, which still technically owns the property, uh, but also from Historic Press. We need to have representatives come down, meet with us, review our plans, see who we're thinking about hiring. A part of Rhode Island Historic Press's goal is that you will use Rhode Island contractors and workers as much as possible. And that was a goal that um, we ascribed to as well. When we finally rebuilt the seawall, for example, we had um, Bob Fairbanks, who is based out of Exeter, Rhode Island, and his engineering team uh, lead the restoration work. But one of the things we have to do in the museum is attend to this doorway here, uh, which looks north up towards East Beach and up towards Holiday House. Uh, you can't really see it too well in this photograph, for which I apologize, but there's some lovely brickwork up here above the transom window. You can't see that. Uh, the other thing you can see just right here, if you've got really good eyesight, uh, that some of the paint is beginning to peel away from the brick. You can imagine the pressure that uh, the Lighthouse Museum building receives um, from storms such as the one that hit yesterday. It's constantly being battered by sea spray, and of course that seeps into the, bu the building no matter what we do. And one of the things that is happening is that the paint is crumbling and the brick beneath it needs serious attention. So this is one of our goals, uh, to speak further to uh, some restoration experts about the sort of paint that should be used in a structure like this that will allow the brick to breathe and will also allow us to give um, full uh, voice to the beautiful masonry and the brickwork that was done so long ago. Here are our windows. These look right out towards the water, right out towards the ocean. And you can see here we have a similar issue dealing with these windows, more moisture. And one of my favorite projects. We're now in the tower. Those of you who've been down to the light know that the exterior uh, is built of westerly granite, and it's in a process called coining, uh, where rectangular blo blocks of granite are set at angles to each other, and it makes a beautiful pattern. So from the outside, uh, it's squared off on the corners. The interior, however, is round brick. And one of the issues that uh, we are facing now is how best to restore the interior of this tower. We've had a number of people come to meet with us. Um, some have suggested something called media blasting which is where you take very fine uh, particles, uh, like ground up shell, for example, and you use this on the surface of these wrought iron stairs uh, to blast off some of the paint flakes that are falling down like rain anytime somebody goes up and down these stairs. Uh, other experts have suggested, you know, really what you need is a very gentle steel brush, scrape the stairs, repaint them and seal them that way. So we are in the process right now of speaking to various different people about which method to use. The other issue is the brickwork inside the tower. Here, down below, it looks relatively contained, and in this photograph, it suggests it's relatively contained. And that's because we did a little bit of restoration work this summer. 
Uh, but that's only extending to a height of about uh, three to four feet. The remaining portion of the tower, and the tower itself runs to about 45 feet in height, the remaining portion of the brick in the tower really also needs some attention. It's crumbling in places, it needs to be repointed, and the mortar needs to be repaired. So again, the question is, who does the work? And then we have to speak to Rhode Island Historic Press and to the US Coast Guard. Representatives, again, from both have specifically looked at this work. And we hope to have um, some of this done during the course of the winter. Uh, it's an interesting challenge always. We also have some, vil uh, some windows in this tower that you can't see in this image that also need replacement because uh, a great deal of moisture blows in uh, from those windows. And now we're in the interior of the residence. The keeper's residence uh, that was built um, originally had uh, one full apartment, two stories in height. Uh, back in a roughly uh, 1961, if I'm correct in saying that, uh, the uh, keeper's residence was divided into two apartments. So we have an upstairs apartment and a downstairs apartment, and we're now looking in the downstairs apartment. This is my pipe dream. Whenever you run a, a nonprofit organization, you always get to insert a little bit of your own hopes and dreams into board meetings. And one of my pipe dreams, one of my wishes, is to turn uh, this room, which is the living space on the ground floor, uh, to turn this room into an extension of the museum. We have a number of issues we have to consider in this, not the least of which is approval from uh, the two organizations I've already mentioned. Uh, we also have the question of ADA access. In other words, can everybody have access? How do we work with a historic building to conform it to ADA compliancy so that everyone can enter the space? One of the things that we are doing now, though, is using this for our board meetings. This is our wonderful table and chairs. Uh, and we now meet down at the lighthouse itself. Uh, for years, meetings were held throughout various locations in Watch Hill, most recently in the um, ground floor of the firehouse. We now have our own space, and um, I also have a little bit of an office um, in this ground floor apartment. So the question is, why are we now using this? We've had a lease from uh, the U.S. Coast Guard starting in 1986. We've had this lease for years. And in recent years, the lease was getting close to expiration. The original lease gave us a 30-year term, and then we got an extension on it that gave us uh, an ex a lease terming up to 2029. But in the last couple of years, we felt that 2029 was getting awfully close, and what could we do to extend it? So the last two years, I have been um, forcibly, gently, politely speaking with the Coast Guard. Uh, they are wonderful, but one of the things that happens in any federal organization is that there is a shift in power and a shift in representation. Sometimes uh, every couple of years, and sometimes within shorter span of time than that. So each time somebody switched their focus on the lighthouse and moved into a different office, I had to reacquaint myself with the new Coast Guard representation. Uh, this summer, uh, we had our newest uh, member of the Coast Guard team come down and visit us, who assured us, in fact, that we were about to get um, a new extension which we did, but Coast Guard uh, policy being what it is and federal government policy being what it is, our newest uh, documentation is no longer formally a lease, it's a license. And one of the terms of that license is that we can no longer rent out uh, apartments for profit. Uh, we are no longer able to sublet. Now, we never really made much of a profit off of having people living at the lighthouse. People lived at the lighthouse for our benefit. They were the eyes, the ears, uh, the safety mechanism. They helped to maintain the property, and we were very grateful for their presence down there. You can imagine that the uh, Watch Hill Light is a pretty desolate place, uh, especially in the winter months. 
Uh, with our new uh, license, we are no longer able to, as I said, sublease. However, we do maintain the upstairs apartment for our property manager, who very carefully um, slid from tenant into property manager, for which I am very grateful. And he um, is not allowed to leave. I'll say that publicly <laughs> here for the record. Uh, so anyway, we had to uh, vacate the ground floor apartment and our tenants who had been living down there for a number of years are relocated happily in New London and we have use of this ground floor space. Uh, as I said, we don't do much with it at the moment. We have our board meetings uh, and uh, I have an office for which again my family is very grateful because a lot of the files that were living in our house are now down at the lighthouse where they belong. I mentioned the Westerly Middle School. Uh, one of my favorite things, not because, or not only because I am a teacher myself, but also because uh, I love sharing historical places. Uh, one of my favorite things is to show the lighthouse to children. And uh, Peter Fasaro, who is right here, shown in shorts, um, has now uh, enriched his uh, fifth grade curriculum uh, with a unit on the history of local lighthouses. So the students uh, travel around, uh, do the research, and learn what they can about various lighthouses. And their history has culminated for the last two years uh, with a visit and a picnic at the Watch Hill Light. Uh, this is Peter kind of wrangling 90 children for a photograph uh, this past June. I developed a little bit of a scavenger hunt to go along uh, with this visit because, as I mentioned earlier, most of the children zip in and out so quickly and just want to go running around on the grass, which I totally appreciate. Uh, but the scavenger hunt aims to center their focus a little bit, uh, help them uh, figure out uh, everything from where was the original life-saving station to what is the lens in the middle of that big case in the middle of the room, and then the question that they all seem to love, uh, who now owns Holiday House up on Watch Hill? And <laughs> many of them are thrilled to, to be able to answer that question. So where do we go from here? Um, this is a, a really wonderful photograph somebody sent me of our uh, big event, the highlight of this past summer season. On July 7, we worked in connection with the Watch Hill Conservancy to host our first big fundraiser. The last time there was any sort of gathering like this down to Lighthouse uh, was in 2007 uh, for our 200th uh, anniversary. At that time, our keynote speaker uh, was Commander uh, Roy Nash, uh, who at the time was the commanding officer um, for the Southeast uh, New England region, and he came and spoke in 2007. We had a lot of local people come down and uh, just enjoy the lighthouse. This was in October. It was over Columbus Day weekend in 2007. But we haven't really had, uh, or we hadn't had, an event uh, since. So last fall, I was approached um, by Deborah Lamb, who is current chair of the Conservancy, and she said, what do you think about a joint fundraiser? And I said, well, speak to me more. One of the ongoing questions is how much do we work with other organizations and how much do we remain autonomous? It's wonderful to have a great deal of interest in the Lighthouse, but we are a separate organization and we wish to remain so. Deb Lamb said, let's do a joint fundraiser. And initially we thought about including all of the organizations who support collectively uh, the various parts of, of the village of Watch Hill. Um, we thought about including the East Beach Association, which maintains East Beach. We thought about including the Memorial Society, Improvement and Memorial Society, I should say, uh, which helps to maintain the village, and then, of course, the two of us. Over the course of the fall, actually starting right about this time last year, we recognized that uh, the scope needed to be a bit more narrow, and we began to take a look at the two wonderful points those being Napa Tree Point and Watch Hill Lighthouse Point, uh, the two wonderful points down in the village. And we realized that we were really doing something to conserve historic areas as well as nature. So Deborah and I, together with a fabulous committee, uh, came up with a plan for this event on July 7. We had over 400 people attend 
And the purpose was to raise funding to go towards the educational and preservation missions of both organizations. The Conservancy, as you may know, uh, takes nature walks for children and adults out to Napa Tree Point. Uh, they maintain a naturalist, a uh, scientist, who is constantly doing research out there about everything from bats. I was treated to one of his bat lectures. Uh, from bats to uh, butterflies and horseshoe crabs. And then, of course, uh, what we're doing at the lighthouse is to keep that property intact, protect it from the onslaught, constant onslaught of the waves and wind, and to be sure that we widen our educational reach. So this is a wonderful photograph somebody took, and I, I can't quite figure out what perspective or what location they were originally on. Uh, but it shows you the tent and the gathering. Um, the question was, you know, again, is this part of our mission, fundraising? How do we do it? Obviously, we have an annual appeal letter that goes out to everybody who so generously supports us. But where does our mission slide into active fundraising that involves a great big event like this? And I'm happy to say that uh, we addressed it, um, as I mentioned, by looking at the two-pronged uh, effect of conservation and preservation. Uh, the community was enormously generous. Uh, we had a lot of children who operated to their great delight. Well, I shouldn't say children. They were actually teenagers and college students. Uh, they operated um, golf carts up and down Lighthouse Road uh, to bring um, everybody down to Lighthouse Road, and we had parking off-site. Uh, this was a wonderful event, and I've been uh, treated to numerous questions about when are you going to do it again, and the answer is not while I'm president. Uh, so <laughs> um, it's terrific, but we have, you know, conserve and preserve was our motto. Um, and we have funding now to go towards uh, the restoration of the tower and the museum, uh, which is exactly uh, what we want to do. So with this image um, as sort of a glorious testament to all that we can do, um, some of the other things that we're working on right now, how do we maintain Lighthouse Road? Lighthouse Road is a private road. It is owned by the people who live on Lighthouse Road. And yet, if you go down to Town Hall here in Westerly, uh, there is a document that gives us an easement in perpetuity to use Lighthouse Road to reach the Lighthouse property. So that's one of our questions. How do we maintain access on what is a private road? How do we encourage people to come down and view the Lighthouse, visit the museum, uh, get photographs for weddings, and yet, how do we not upset the neighbors who justifiably don't want to see uh, constant traffic? It's a problem. It was a problem yesterday with the numbers of people going down to watch the spectacular waves uh, down at Lighthouse Point. I was one of the people who got caught in the traffic jam. We maintain a security guard at the entrance uh, to Lighthouse Road, but not every day and not in the off season. That's a considerable expense that we foot ourselves. And so one of the questions is, how do we delicately balance our relationship with our neighbors? We have the issue of making that museum more historically appropriate. Once we get approval to uh, renovate the museum and get going on the issues that I showed you earlier of the paint flecking off in the museum and the windows that are uh, seeping moisture, what I'd like to do is take everything out of the museum, catalog it, take a look at it, look at the things that are in my home, and then rehang the museum images in such a way that a story is actually told start to finish. I am constantly looking uh, through various websites that sell artifacts and uh, objects related to lighthouses. There are quite a lot of them out there. People are forever uh, greeting me with questions about, you know, would you like this, would you like that? Yes, we'd like everything. We may tell you in the end, thank you very much, but we would like to take a look at everything because it all helps to tell the story. And mainly I just want to say, you know, that you can't do this work alone. Um, Betty Jo Green is in the back. She's one of our board members. She has been absolutely marvelous all the way along. Uh, in helping me uh, run this museum, run this lighthouse, and make sure that the public continues uh, to visit, because that's why we do what we do. So thank you. Thank you. 
And I'm happy to yeah, answer any questions if anybody has them, if there's anything that I can answer. So at the, yeah, so at the moment, uh, we are only seasonal. Um, one of the issues we face also is how do we staff the museum? The Watch Hill uh, Memorial Library and Improvement Society at the moment um, is our major source of docents. They are a volunteer organization as well, and their chief ob objective is to preserve the village. But a lot of the women who are members of this organization do extensive volunteer work down at the lighthouse. So we're open at the moment uh, from right around the 4th of July through the end of the first week of September. Now that's the museum. The property itself, per the terms of our license with the Coast Guard, is open from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. or at this time of the year, roughly sunrise to sunset. Uh, the property is open for everyone to go down and enjoy, wander around. Um, that, is, that is never closed, except really at night, even though we do have children who go down there quite a bit. Um, so that's what we are. We're trying to experiment with ways to uh, lengthen the season, uh, but the museum has no heat either, um, so that's a little chilly. And uh, in the height of the summer, it's Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday from 1 to 3. Again, these are hours that we would like to lengthen because we have a lot of people who uh, would like to see the museum and they can't make it at those times. Uh, what I will say, for fear of getting a rush, but it, it, does, it is true, um, I will open that museum up for somebody who you know, emails me. I do that all the time. I take people down there, give them a private tour because I, I love showing off this lighthouse. So if there's a family that is only visiting at some strange time, or we get members, as we did last January, from the United States Lighthouse Society. Um, I had, I don't know, 50 people come through uh, last January, frigid temps, uh, but they loved it. We can't go up into the tower. That's the one thing we're prohibited from doing because of our license. Uh, the Coast Guard does not want the liability of people going um, up and down the stairs. Uh, so that's something that we um, have to be very careful uh, not to have happen. Pamela, do you, yeah. Do you have the ability to store or archive donations? Because you you're sounds like when you open the gate for donations, you run the risk of getting a lot. A lot. <laughs> and do you have the ability? Uh, we do have the ability to store sort of hard artifacts. Um, what is a bit more challenging is paper. We uh, received from Pam Lyons, who runs the Charlestown Historical Society, um, received from her a number of years ago a fascinating and a very delicate um, paper logbook from the life-saving station that was down at the lighthouse. And the logbook contains uh, not only a list of deliveries that, was, that were being made to um, the life-saving station, uh, food products, in other words, uh, so it lists those, but also lists recipes uh, that were produced. This logbook is absolutely fascinating and so um, fragile that turning the pages has to be done essentially um, with a very thin um, metal page turner. You can't even put your fingers on it. So we have that. What do we do with that? Um, we want to be able to display it. At the moment, because we don't have a place to display it, it's being held carefully off-site by one of our board members who actually works in museum conservation. Um, and we've been speaking sort of off and on with paper conservators about photographing some of the pages and then producing images that we can then hang in the museum because we will never be able to really uh, display an object like that. So this, these are uh, some of the challenges that we face when we get paper um, objects. Uh, Ellen uh, Madison gave us um, some wonderful um, objects, which I spoke about, paper documents um, from one of her ancestors who uh, was down at the Life Saving Station. I have those in my home. Those we will be able to uh, display once we renovate the museum. I haven't forgotten about them, Ellen. I use them all the time. Yeah, you are now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that 
No, it's, it's wonderful for us. I mean, Bill Brown, who gave us the, the Knowlton um, bits, uh, also gave us a whole lot of personal uh, materials related to his ancestors who got married here in Westerly. Um, so those are uh, objects that we're not quite sure um, how to thread them into the museum. But nonetheless, they uh, give information on you know, the people who live there, people who work there. Uh, so we love that. We love that. Yeah, what Ellen. What kind of problems do you have with vandalism? Oh, Bob. Yes, ma'am. Vandalism. Uh, Bob um, occasionally is greeted with some not so charming visitors, uh, teenagers at night. Uh, sometimes lights are blown out. Um, he had an experience in the garage this summer. It's mostly kids. Oh, yes. Yeah, so that's very helpful. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, the museum itself is fully alarmed, so we are completely protected that way. And, and having Bob in the second floor down there um, as our property manager is enormously helpful, for which I thank you again. Well, he's the prisoner that can't leave. Yeah, he cannot leave, no. <laughs> you know, I like the idea of you know, moving the museum into the building because one of the fascinating things to me about the Lighthouse thing is Jonathan Nash, you know, the first Lighthouse keeper when he had, I think it was like 11 kids or something, and then when you look at the size of the apartments in there, you're thinking 11 kids in this place, and like back in 18, you know, whatever, I mean, it was, and I was reading this book recently on, you know, Lighthouse Keepers, and it was really a rugged business. Oh, yeah. And it would be interesting to like restore those rooms in the lighthouse to like what they look like in like 18, you know, whatever it is, 56. Yeah, because this has all been, you know, it was renovated in 61 and then again in the 1990s, so you know, there's, yeah, the, yeah. Whatever, you know, they, they, they made things with the flax looms and they, in fact, I just was looking at the, um, Jonathan Nash when he was uh, sent some supplies from the, you know, Lighthouse Society or whatever it was, and uh, the list of stuff like whale oil and oxides or, or buffalo hides and a lot of this like incredibly interesting wicks and, you know, lamps for the, for the light, because I, I assume the original light before the personal lens was... It's an oil lamp, yeah. Yeah, it was a whale mm -hmm. oil? Mm -hmm. It was originally whale oil, yeah. Yeah, and that lifestyle, which, to keep those whale oil lights, which smoked a lot, so you had to constantly clean the glass, the glass obviously got broken, and keep the whale oil stuff, I mean, it was really a rough life, you know, to try to keep the heat going and everything else, so it's kind of be interesting to do like that. that that is my dream. Um, whether I will uh, still be president to, to see that happen. I mean, there the the other part of being on a board is knowing when you should not be on a board anymore. Uh, so that's also part of the delicate balance. How long should I stay? <laughs> yes. How much of the history have you had? Uh, you have the original say logs. Uh, well, e right here there are logs, actually, which I learned when I came to a talk last November. The Historical Society Westerly has a whole bunch of information here. Um, uh huh. Yeah, there are some of our actual log books are here. Uh, obviously, the library has a whole bunch of bits and pieces. Um, actual documentation that we have, that we own, very little, very little. So that's why we're open to anybody who finds something and says, hey, you know, as Ellen did when she came up with, with the letters that were directly connected to the life saving station. Those were the first examples of anything like that that we received. Um, Bill Brown's documentation. Um, so it's, it's just beginning. Because for so many years, you know, the lighthouse was simply run as, as part of the Coast Guard, and there wasn't much thought given to the history of the lighthouse. That's changing. So, 
We'd love more. Yes? Hi. What does it mean to be automated? I'm sorry that I'm like so it, it means that we have an automatic um, light up in the tower now that runs on its own electric power instead of the Fresnel lens, which was operated by a whole complicated sort of clockwork system. Uh, so. Well, it also means that the, the Coast Guard no longer runs the lighthouse. That's part of it. The Coast Guard owns the lighthouse property, which is why we have our license from them. Uh, but they removed their last two uh, officers from the Coast Guard, uh, moved them out of there in 86, and actually technically the 31st of August of 86, and turned it over to us. So automated, meaning that the Coast Guard doesn't need to come down there on a, on a daily basis nor maintain anybody living there uh, because the light works by itself, more or less, um, and they don't have personnel on staff living at the lighthouse. Having said that, we are still an active aid to navigation, which means that representatives from the Coast Guard come down periodically to check on the fog signal, uh, to check on the light, uh, and that is a relationship you know, the, between us and the Coast Guard that may flip at some point, uh, but at the moment, um, for the foreseeable future, that's, that's the connection that we have with the Coast Guard. Yes? Did you digitize your, uh, your archives at all? Uh, because you think back to the Boston Public Library when they had the flood, how much got lost because it was not, there was no yeah, we have to do that too. Uh, we are slowly working on that. Um, Betty Jo Green is helping me with part of that. Yeah. <laughs> We're just at the very infancy sort of stages of all of that, but yes, that's something that also has to happen, um, especially when we, if we do move it all out and move it all back in, we need to do that and catalog it properly. Absolutely. Thank you. Brian, since Brenda mentioned, uh, you mentioned Brian Cooper, mm -hmm. uh, the, the interior case. Uh, we have a quite a relationship with him here at the Historical Society. Of course, he spearheaded the uh, Pendleton Chapman property for Charles speaking about that renovation. Some right. of these restored properties out on Russell's Vineyard in his ticket, he may be able to help you with paint I in an exposed area because yeah. he has that experience of He's on our list. <laughs> yes, exposed <coughs> properties and paint. Yeah. I, I really He's been he's been phenomenal. Actually, so thank you. Yeah, he's he's a real asset, and he's here. He's local. So. Oh. No, he's a lovely guy. So, we're hopeful. Thank you. So, with the restoration of the museum. <coughs> Will it be made weather tight so that it can be climate controlled year round? That's a good question. Uh, that, that would climate good. controlled would be um, something we'd have to carefully look at because whenever you take uh, objects that have not been subject to uh, heat, that's a question about whether they can take heat. Uh, the lens is one of those objects. Um, the lens has always sort of ebbed and flowed with whatever the weather conditions are. Um, so that's something that we'll have to investigate. Um, we haven't really had that conversation. Right now we're sort of more looking at uh, making sure the walls are clean, the windows are set right, 
um, and then, as I said, rehanging so that the story is told in a way that, you know, s it makes sense. Thinking primarily of humidity because that's yeah. a very humid place. If you can keep the room dry. Well, we have a lovely dehumidifier going all the time. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. Well, thank you all, and I'm happy to, you know, take any other questions up here. But thank you, and come on down. Now it's chilly, but you're welcome. Thank you for coming. You're welcome.